Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thank you to all of you, including Carmine Bailey, Vince Power, and John and Becky Johnston. Coming up on DTNS, can Zamatum get you food in 10 minutes? How real do you want your social networks? And does the Mac Studio hold secrets? DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, March 21st, 2022. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple's latest Apple TV update has removed the option to buy and rent movies from the Apple TV app on Android TV and Google TV, though previous movie purchases are still available. Apple TV's app came to both Google TV and Android TV last year, offering Apple TV Plus access, channels, and rentals and purchases from iTunes directly on the device. A new How to Watch message states, you can buy, rent, or subscribe in the Apple TV app on iPhone, iPad, and other streaming devices. Oh, the irony. Mm. The irony. The Verge reports that the most recent Windows 11 release preview uh, build adds a watermark to the desktop. So if you're using a workaround to run the operating system on an unsupported hardware device, you will now see a system requirements not met notice asking you if you want to visit settings to learn more. There don't appear to be any feature limitations, however. Just a nudge. Hmm. A Moscow court banned Facebook and Instagram in Russia with a judge ruling the app's activities as extremist. You may be saying, didn't they already do this? Well, Russia's communications regulator Roskomnadzor already blocked access to the apps. The extremist designation opens the door to bringing criminal charges against Meta employees in Russia, although I don't believe their uh, reporting says that there are no uh, Meta employees in Russia at the moment. WhatsApp does still remain available in the country. Foxconn announced it basically resumed normal work order and production operations at its factory at factory campuses in Shenzhen following shutdowns due to spread, uh, spreading of COVID-19 infections in the city. The company coordinated with local government last week to start resuming operations by arranging for some staff to live and work in a bubble on the campuses. Basically. The New York Times reports that Brazil lifted its ban on the messaging app Telegram after its Supreme Court blocked the app late last week. The app's reinstatement came after it made changes to combat misinformation. This includes things like removing classified information, labeling posts with false information, promoting factual sources, and monitoring Brazil's 100 most popular Telegram channels. All right, Rich, let's talk a little bit more about getting dinner in a really quick way. <laughs> yeah, we, we've seen some... We've seen some companies try and do like really fast grocery, uh, you know, delivery, but the delivery service Zomato announced it will launch a new service called Zomato Instant next month. And it's offering 10 minute delivery for food, not groceries. That's, you know, a number of startups have tried that. Zomato even, in fact, has tried it a couple of times, kind of hasn't stuck as a permanent feature for their service. No, Zomato Instant is offering hot prepared food to you 10 minutes after ordering. And this will initially launch in Zomato's home city of Guru Gram in India. So... Uh, obviously just launching this in a test market. A lot of questions about this. I guess the first one, Sarah, there's there's obviously a utility for it, right? I mean, I, I, 10 minutes like stresses me out. It's like so close to when I'm ordering it. I don't know, just the idea of it being so close. I mean, is that just off the bat, like does, does the window of that seem reasonable to you? It does not at all. However, <laughs> I will say, um, and I have not been to Guru Gram in India specifically, but I know that getting fresh food delivered, you know, for lunch and dinner when somebody is off working is very, very commonplace um, in a lot of uh, the Indian subcontinent. And that is sort of part of life. And fresh, delicious food is also part of life there. So I can see where the market for this would be big. But how do you, I mean, okay, so I live, I live in the woods. I mean, I'm not too far from civilization, but I'm really not close enough to any kitchen to be 10 minutes away to get it delivered fresh. So my question is, what exactly is being delivered and when yeah. was it made? That's the question. Roger, you have, uh, you know, experience in the food industry. Your family does for sure. I mean, what what red flags do you like see? Like, uh, the, 10 like minutes. How this is that's possible? the red flag. <laughs> 10 minutes. 
I mean, all right. So let, let's just say, let's for argument's sake that it's not cooked food. It's a packaged food. 10 minutes is still a pretty tight stretch for delivery, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're in an urban yeah. center with a lot of traffic, a lot of pedestrians, a lot of uh, uh, obstacles to overcome. Now, if you could put in there, we're going to cook your food. I mean, I don't know about you, but cook times on the short side is 10 minutes, unless you are like microwaving your reheated leftovers, or you're already bringing food in from something that's already been cooked, but uh, something that Sarah was alluding to, like, for example, a buffet style table where yeah. you cook all the food ahead of time, typically in the morning, you have it out. So, hey, I want... You know, I want uh, I want the mashed potatoes with with you know the fried chicken and you know whatever else that you have, and you just kind of put those into portions and you put it in the box and you send it to a driver. No cooking involved. Technically, it's cooked, but it was cooked you know four hours or typically two hours ahead of time. Well, there, there's a couple things that we do know, like specifics about what Zamato is trying to do here. So the the big news is that this isn't look. It's not going to be looking like they're going to be squeezing their delivery drivers on this. In fact, they're saying they're not even going to let their delivery drivers know that these are within these 10 minute window. These are just going to be treated as standard food delivery orders from a driver perspective. And where they're they're saying they're going to be able to cut that time and make that time possible is according to them, they're going to be using a sophisticated dish level demand prediction algorithms, which sounds delicious and future ready in station robotics. So kind of automated stuff. So the idea is if you have a restaurant with an extremely limited menu, um, I, I, in the pre-show I, I referenced, you know, raising canes is like a chicken place. They literally just do fried chicken. They know at lunchtime, they're going to serve X amount of like, at, you know, at, between the hours of 12 and two or whatever like that. And any given day, they're going to make X amount of chicken. They can, they can have that ready. And if you, if you limit your menu and, and you know that, through some analytics like, hey, we make so much of this dish every single day, you can have that and still have it within a reasonable window where it's not a buffet style, where it's not four minutes out or, or four hours out or something like that, it, and and I, still be able to to have that already, right? I mean, that is, that's the fast food model, right? That's where, mm -hmm. you, you know, contrary to popular belief, McDonald's doesn't cook 100 hamburgers and lets them sit. They produce. They produce what they what they order, and if they anticipate. They can say, "Hey, we're going to line up. We're going to need about twenty Big Macs." So, right, you, yeah, you, based you, on you get what we on. know, people will do it. Exactly, noon, you know. So, I mean, it could very well be a very limited uh, item menu. It's probably going to be a very pop. They're going to very popular dishes, so you're never going to be left with any leftovers at the end yeah. because they're always going to sell. Um, but still, I mean, you know, ten minutes. More power to them. I would love to see how this works and exactly what they're offering because everything that goes in my mind says, yeah, you can either make it fast uh, or you can make it good or, or you can make it cheap, but you know, you got to pick two here. Um, and, and it's one of those things where, you know, this um, is also something that yeah. is just going to work in certain markets. Exactly. Uh, you know, if exactly. you identify the market, great. Uh, and, and if you can get well, something to, you know, somebody that, that, feels and tastes fresh within 10 minutes, that's pretty cool. But most markets can't actually, uh, it, it's just not possible. Well, and to, to that point, Sarah, India, now obviously there are many, many markets within India, but in general, like these, this quick commerce uh, uh, delivery portion is an increasing part of the overall delivery uh, uh, marketplace there. Uh, last year, 2021, 13% of all online grocery deliveries were within like a 20 minute window uh, for them. So this is an increase. Now, obviously, grocery and hot food delivery, different things, but this is an increasingly important market uh, in India specifically. Uh, and definitely one, you know, Zomato just uh, announced that they're attending to acquire Blinkit uh, for $700 million. So this is something where they're, they're very much investing uh, in down. this space. Yeah. Uh, uh, putting their, uh, their money where their delivery mouth is. <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, I, I want it to succeed. I would love this option for myself. I would pay a premium if I'm like, I'm hungry. Can I get food in 10 minutes? Hot dinner food? Not just like a bunch of groceries. I'd be into that. All right, moving on. As drones take on a lot more utilitarian purposes, they also have to be able to withstand a lot of elements. Depending on where you live and what you're using your drone for, it has to be pretty robust. Well, DJI might be best known for its consumer Mavic and Phantom drones. It also makes industrial grade drones. They're hardy, but even its former top of the line M30 
uh, 300 RTK drone wasn't recommended to fly in the snow or heavy rain. It's just, it's too much, too much element. However, DJI announced a new drone that's cleared to tackle those elements, the M30 Enterprise, able to fly in temperatures from 20 below to 15 uh, degrees Celsius, Celsius in rain, wind, or snow, and officially rated for IP55 weather sealing. Weather sealing is only part of the story because like DJI's uh, consumer drones, the M30 folds down to be able to flip into a small rolling case weighing just 8.2 pounds, little guy, and be able to deploy without needing to screw into the arms like previous DJI uh, Enterprise drones. Flight time is limited to 41 minutes. So there's the rub. But it also supports the use of the DJI dock, which is basically a drone in a box solution for autonomous deployments. Although that is limited uh, in the US, at least at this time. Regulations require drone pilots to stay within line of sight. So uh, there is some room to grow there. But the M30, if you're interested at this point, starts at 10,000 US dollars. And that is without the uh, the DJI dock uh, either. That's like they're, they're they're like partnering that out right now. Uh, yeah. So we we will see where that happens. That that to me is is the interesting side of the story because you know we've we've seen these uh, ultra portable drones. You know the Mavics kind of you know kind of changed the the consumer drone landscape in terms of size and capability and that kind of stuff. We there there have been industrial drones uh, for quite a while that can handle the elements and stuff like that, but. What's, what's interesting to me here is you have DJI taking a lot of those consumer focused features and making it very easy so that you don't have to be, uh, obviously you probably should be certified to, to operate a drone, but like a lot of those autonomous flight features, a lot of that uh, quick deployment features and stuff like that are gonna come in real handy where you could have uh, one of these DJI docks on a, a fire truck or something like that. You could have these totally. in very, in very mm -hmm. remote places that basically only need power because one of the things about this dock is it has a 4G dongle that you can put onto it. So it can maintain connectivity uh, over a pretty wide range and you can it does fast charging and stuff like that. So yes, the flight time is limited, but really useful for remote drone applications and, and uh, emergency stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm I'm definitely a person who I don't own a drone. Uh, I I I understand how they work, um, and not all drones are, are are equal. But it's just not it. You know, as a hobbyist thing, it's not something that I need. For an emergency device, I think that, you know, that $10,000 price point that people say, that's crazy. Why would you? I mean, for what you've described, Rich, it, it actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And there, there are some really interesting use cases for this. Another one is like emergency rescue, because one of the things you can do with this is you can put on a uh, radiometric thermal camera on this, which basically uh, detects surface temperature. So it's really good to detecting, hey, a warm body uh, in an otherwise cold area and stuff like that. So, you know, you could very rapidly... And again, they, people use drones for this already. It's just this is again another uh, a, a simplification of this, and mm -hmm. I'm sure D won't be the only one uh, to do this. But like again, this kind of all in one, all, I guess all in one packaging and and combination of features makes me excited for the possibilities that we could see for this in ways. You know, when we hear uh, a couple of years ago, we heard about drones being used to to help fight wildfires or monitor wildfires and stuff like that, something we hadn't really thought of before. That's what this kind of makes me think of. It's like, okay, yeah. we have a super connected, very ruggedized drone we can kind of put anywhere. What can we do with that? That's the well, say so It's like, think of helicopters. And the fact that, you know, a, 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 a high speed chase, you know, in wherever it is, you know, and the helicopter being able to help whoever's on the ground identify what's going on and 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 get them to the to to the situation closer than they would be able to otherwise. I mean, a drone is like 100 times better than the helicopter if you know how to operate it correctly because it's small, it's light, uh, you know, withstand the elements. You don't have to, you know, <laughs> pay for like well, a huge amount of gas and a pilot. I, I mean, I, I do think this is the future of law enforcement, but also emergency services. Well, and and one of the big things I can totally see this for is maintenance, especially if you're, uh, if you're in charge of a large skyscraper or building and you need to check through because oftentimes condominiums have this issue there's a lot of structural issues that come with age and you can't always hire someone to come down and shimmy down the 
the the window cleaner uh, 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 equipment and then check everything you uh, you know individually you can just have it fly up and down and give you a, a quick overview could you say okay there's a spot we should really check out instead of having to wait uh, on hiring someone specialized and that of course adds time and uh, complications I mean it it's it's I mean it's what you said rich it's a turnkey solution people don't have to think about it you pay the one price and it should all work all right, well, moving on here. Apple's switch to using its own uh, silicon has gone relatively smoothly, all things considered. Uh, the M1 and its derivatives have provided efficient performance. Uh, it seems to scale from thin and light laptops to workstation. We just saw that uh, with uh, the Mac Studio, with the reviews coming out for that. The big con, though, noted by a lot of reviewers and users, these new machines are, per are entirely locked down, not upgradable. Now, uh, even when going back to the days of x86 in recent years, Apple laptops have been completely locked down in terms of upgrades and stuff like that. The desktop side wasn't quite as bad. Uh, users could at least upgrade memory on things like the recent iMacs, uh, iMacs and Mac minis. Uh, and the refresh Mac Pro was kind of uh, uh, an open dream uh, in, in comparison to a lot of other Apple products able to upgrade all sorts of stuff on that machine. The lack of upgradability seems more apparent as Apple released that Mac Studio, and that's you know kind of a pro workstation kind of model. Apple oddly describes it as modular, but outside of a healthy dose of I.O. on the front and the back, seems a bit of marketing bluster, or maybe not. A teardown of the Mac Studio by the YouTube channel Max Tech revealed two M2 style connectors used for proprietary Apple SSDs, indicating storage might be upgradable after purchase if Apple provided the parts in the video to actually take them out and you know take a look at them. These slots do not seem to accept standard M2 uh, connectors, just a small short SSD-like modules. Storage has been soldered onto all other uh, Apple Silicon computers at this point. So this is kind of the, what's, what's notable about the, is that there's any kind of connector at all that is in any way user accessible, even though you have to, you know, go through all sorts of Torx bits and, and other screws and stuff like that. Uh, so Sarah, some Mac Studio secrets? Maybe, maybe. When I read the story this morning, I was sort of like, well, okay. I mean, there are lots of things that if you open up the guts of an uh, Apple device, you might say, hmm, interesting. Seems like maybe they've left room for expansion here, but we just haven't seen it yet. So on one hand, I think, well, that might just be what this is. But at the same time, what is it? You know, what's, what is it for? Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is actually, I mean, there's always the possibility that this is some sort of diagnostic port. You know, Apple does a ton of service in store. So maybe this is this is something, it's, it's a pro machine, obviously not something you just want to wholesale replace. Maybe, maybe this is just a diagnostic port, always a possibility. Mm -hmm. But I've had this thought for a while now that Apple seems to be paying more than just lip service to things like sustainability, uh, uh, really pushing uh, recycled materials, not just in cases, but like literally how the, their, their PCBs and their chips and stuff like that are put together, trying to at least emphasizing it very publicly that they're using a lot of uh, reused and recycled materials, uh, which is great. I'm not saying that. But the, the fact that all of these are unupgradable seems like a completely missing chunk to this. And when I saw that there were these, these modules in here, it kind of got me thinking that I would not be surprised if down the road, and this is just based on me kind of seeing where there's an opening in the market here where Apple loves to sell you services, Apple loves to sell you stuff in the Apple store. If down the road you get some kind of in-place upgrade for these pro style machines, maybe not in a MacBook Air, even or in a Mac mini, but on the Mac Studio, the up whatever the upcoming Mac Pro refresh looks like, that you'll be able to go into the store, uh, keep the same case, keep a lot of the same components, they switch out parts of uh, you know the motherboard with the processor to give you the, whatever the M2 is or something like that. You keep all that nice IO. None of that IO is going out of date anytime soon. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you can have that in-place replacement and they just swap out the SSDs. They do some sort of secure thing so it's all encrypted and they don't see any of it. Uh, uh, and, and you're able to have that in place and they can sell that to you, obviously. And I feel like that would be a greener solution than you even giving it to them and they recycle the case and everything like that. So Again, this is this is just looking at the market, but to me, that would be a, a, a way that they could fulfill that modularity pledge when they announce this machine uh, in, a, in a really meaningful way. Uh, if nothing else, hopefully someone can reverse engineer these and figure out how to make a third party part for these, right? 
I just feel, I feel like the, you know, the thing that Apple does, as you've explained, is, you know, it's, things are proprietary, they're locked down, you, you uh, if you like to get inside and tinker, you know, you, you uh, have a soldering machine, like, best of luck with an Apple product, they don't make it easy for you. But the fact that this seems to be like, oh, Apple may be, you know, opening the door for some possibilities in the future, but absolutely no marketing materials have said as such is why people are wondering now. Yes, the secrets. Well, if you have thoughts on uh, what Apple is doing behind the scenes or you uh, have thoughts on anything or want to hear about us talk about something specific on the show, one way to let us know is in our subreddit. Subreddit is fun. You can submit stories and vote on other stories at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right. So we, uh, we've got a lot of social media apps in the world, Rich. Uh, I, I have given up on, on <laughs> keeping up on many of them. However, there are always more options. You think of Instagram, kind of the giant in the space of photo apps. Visco is another app. Uh, both have thrived by building an aesthetic. You know, you want to show people your cool vacation. You look as good as possible. The light is glowing, etc. These apps include filters and editing tools to let users present that idealized, glamorized version of life. And we've seen some pushback because of that. Mental health consequences to these kinds of highly curated images that don't necessarily represent real life with Instagram's in internal research, finding that the app made some teenage girls feel worse about body image. So protocol covered a newer social network that may appeal to you. It's looking to stand apart from that Instagram highly curated feed model, but doesn't embrace the pure ephemerality of something like Snapchat either. Somewhere in between. It's called Be Real, B-E-R-E-A-L, and it lets users post just a single time per day. You want to post? You got to post just once. But it's not about limiting screen time. It's about creating a shared experience. So to explain, every day Be Real users in the same time zone get a notification at the same time, time to post. From there, you have two minutes to post a simultaneous capture of your front and rear phone camera. So it's designed to be like, here's me and here's what I'm looking at. Here's where I am. If you post late, not within the time frame, you still can post, but your photo will be tagged noting you did not make the cutoff and did not play the game accordingly. The other, <laughs> other differentiator is that you can't view the new post of the day until you post your own. So if you want to lurk and just look at everybody's posts all day, it doesn't really work on Be Real. You have to participate as well. The app uh, caught uh, caught on in its home country of France with university students back in spring of 2021. So depending on where you live, you might be uh, familiar with Be Real. I heard about it for the first time today. It's also trying to aggressively expand on U.S. Uh, college campuses, which seems to be a good breeding ground for this kind of thing. I don't know, Rich. I I uh, I like Instagram. I'm on Instagram every day. My dog has an Instagram account, so you know it keeps me quite busy. But I get the fatigue. I get the fatigue of all of this. And I get the the sort of a new social network saying, OK, so it's not um, a, about, you know, showing us that you have like the best life ever. It's just where you are, what you're doing. But I don't know if that's too mundane for this to catch on, you know, in a widespread way. Yeah, that that is the question is, is how does this have staying power when it's just going to be a bunch of people sitting around and like a like an awkward selfie but i wouldn't put it past people to develop some sort of uh you know like a meme culture or or just any kind of uh, like cultural practice around that but what got me really interested about this is it feels like very much the same dynamic as wordle right where it's like you wake up you open up wordle on your phone or whatever and you're then right. like you yeah. you do it and you're done for the day like the, yeah, the wordle... and you're not allowed to like obsess over it you know, it's yeah, you, you can't you buy more light or you to don't. It. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. And if you miss it for the day, it's like, oh, okay. And then you can, you can share in everybody's, oh, okay, here's how you approach this. Now there's a different dynamic there where it's like, oh, what were you doing at 10 52 AM uh, on a Saturday? Oh, you were uh, sitting around in your pajamas drinking coffee. That's great. Yeah. Like the, I, the concept of it is very interesting to me. So I, I signed up for be real 
I know I have some family in college. No one has signed up for it. So I am not perhaps representative of the, the college youth uh, that <laughs> that like that. No, but, and they might be targeting, you know, back in the yeah. early Facebook days, it was the same. It wasn't yeah, like a, a every bunch of college Coast, kid yeah. was like super into Facebook. But what I will say, even knowing that literally no one was going to see what I would post, I got the notification like, hey, it's time to post. You got two minutes. And it was like, that was, I could see that being a very anxiety inducing thing, especially if you're oh, younger gosh. and, I mean, you know, and you want, I, and you're like, like you have to be in with your friend group to be like, oh, what were you, why didn't you post? Oh, I can't see your post. You were talking well, about and it. And imagine if you're like, I don't know, in the shower or like whatever, whatever is going on that day, you're like, mm, can't, you know, <laughs> I don't want the world to know. This is just not something I need to share with the world. It's a different dynamic for sure. It's a, it's a, yeah, like full reality versus uh, a very uh, shiny faux reality. And yeah. there's probably room for both, but I, but I am interested. Be real is a great example of, you know, is, does Instagram have a shelf life? Uh, I mean, you could argue that depending on usage around the world, we're already seeing signs of this, but mm -hmm what what is next what is the cool new thing and i'm not even like going to bring up TikTok and and snapchat because i think that they have their own markets but is there is there a real life we're all in it together kind of social network that will emerge and would it be something like be real uh i, I do know that if they ever do try to monetize this that there are a bunch of advertisers that would love to know that all your users are going to be looking at your app at one two minute increment during the day for <laughs> no like kidding. for like live promotion stuff. I could like as 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 a like a commerce thing, I could totally see the the appeal for that. Uh, that's probably a ways down the road for Be Real though. Well, Rich, I have good news for you because I know you love the film, and 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 I mean uh, of of the DTNS crew, you are the film aficionado of our crew, so. Photo products and services Kodak Moments, that's a division of Kodak Alaris, has launched Kodak Gold 200 film and a new 120 format five roll pro pack for medium format cameras. Now, if you don't have a medium format camera, you probably don't even know what it is, but those who do know and love it. Kodak says it's designed for all photographers. You don't have to be an expert photographer, just somebody who's enthusiastic about getting into the medium format with the film combining warm, saturated color, fine grain, and high sharpness. Now, fans of medium format already know that the quality of scanned images is great for digital output and even when cropped because your negatives are bigger. But Rich, I know, I know you care about this. Is this something you've ordered? I it though okay so they've started selling it to retailers they haven't actually put it on sale to the public yet which is very frustrating because i mm. was looking to buy possibly buy some today so for the video viewers i have a 35 millimeter roll here and a 120 roll so you can see just the negative is much taller and it's also like way wider it's like that wide uh, compared to a 35 millimeter negative what's exciting about this is for years kind of the the dread that every person that enjoys film is it's like fuji film is very notorious now for every seemingly every year taking away a film stock. There aren't a lot, especially color. Color is very hard to produce. It's very expensive to produce. Uh, and, and the scales that you need to make it work, basically there's three, maybe four companies that can do it. Um, and so the fact for, for Fuji, even though Kodak Gold still exists in 35 millimeter, to bring it to 120 is very exciting. It also speaks to them uh, 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 finally overcoming a lot of supply chain issues that they've had, not necessarily related to the pandemic, but the issue with making film is that to spin up the machines to code it and stuff, uh, you need to waste a lot of film uh, essentially that's that's unusable to do so. So it only really makes sense for them to do it in, in mm. big batches, but then if it sells out, they there can go a long time where like literally every single place is sold out of Kodak Gold or uh, Portra or something like that or Ektar. Um, so the, the fact that Kodak feels confident enough to launch a consumer lower priced variant, probably lower margin also as well, tells me they wouldn't do this uh, unless they felt like they could meet the, those supply challenges better. Maybe they're doing smaller, they figured out how to do smaller batch productions more efficiently, uh, that kind of stuff. So more film is better. Kodak has introduced film, reintroduced films in, in different formats before. Most recent mm -hmm. was Ektachrome, I think in 2019, 2018, something like that. Uh, but to see a consumer relatively affordable film stock come back, very exciting uh, in the world of film today.
Yeah, it's good, it's good stuff. Uh, it, we we had a conversation last Monday, I believe it was, about vinyl and cassettes and CDs and all sorts of like throwbacky stuff coming back uh, into vogue in certain circles. And this feels like just like the like absolute pinnacle of that trend is uh, medium format cool film from Kodak. It's it's glorious. I can't Kodak wait to get a hold of it. Kodak Gold. Kodak Gold 200. New 120 format. Five roll. Uh, remember <laughs> to look out for Photography News Monthly next week um, in our feed uh, for patrons. And, you know, we we uh, we like to geek out on photography stuff uh, in a little bit more detail. We so. cover the film news there, too. Yeah. Indeed. 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 Uh, speaking of, thanks to all of our patrons, patreon.com slash GTNS is where you can find out more about how to directly support the show. We also got a brand new boss over the weekend. And you know who that boss name is? Nick. Nick just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. You made my Woo. Monday. Woo, woo, woo. There also is a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. We've changed things up a tiny bit around here, but uh, we've gotten really good feedback so far. So th thanks to everybody who uh, watches or listens to both shows. Want to know more? Patreon.com slash DTNS. Good Day Internet starts in just a few, but just a reminder that we are live on this here show, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back doing it all again tomorrow with Charlotte Henry. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>